I think the ghost probably wanted us out of there. I don't stay in old cabins anymore. I think it was grandma trying to get us out of her house. All the noises were angry, angry noises intended to scare us. She had lived there her whole life. She had died in that house and that she didn't want strangers staying there. My friend Westy and I were uh, with um, our friend Rob. Our friend Rob was gonna be shipping out to uh, Afghanistan. He was getting married before he was leaving. Uh, he was marrying a girl from Forks, Washington, and they were gonna have the wedding in Forks. So we met in Port Angeles, which is where we grew up, and we all piled into my car on the morning of the wedding to drive out to Forks. You see the cowboy hats she's making us wear? Yeah, I kinda like them. Oh my God, you're a sadist. Yeah, I'd wear those cowboy hats all the time. <laughs> It's about a 50-mile drive along kind of a long, winding, you know, Highway 101, two-lane highway. As we were driving out there, my uh, left tire blew, which meant that we had to change the tire on the road. So I had a spare on, so we could only drive about 20 miles an hour. And we figured it was too dangerous to drive back. So I was going to have to wait until the morning so I could get a replacement tire for the car. It's cold. We weren't ready for that at all. We thought we were gonna drive out, go to the wedding, go home. No, we didn't have sleeping bags, no change of clothes. Really didn't think things through at all. We weren't gonna be able to sleep in the car. We made it on time and I had a nice little ceremony and then they had the reception. We'd asked if we could stay the night at the bride's family's house, and uh, they had said that we couldn't. And we didn't have enough money to rent a hotel room for the night, so we didn't have anywhere to stay. There ain't no spare beds anywhere. Not even a couch. <sighs> the bride offered to take us to her grandma's cabin, which was out towards La Push, and uh, that grandma had died about six months beforehand. So it was sitting there empty with, with nobody there. Rob's wife said her uncle had been using that house as a hunting lodge. And she warns us that the uncle doesn't know the wedding's happening, doesn't know we're staying there, and he didn't take his mom's death very well. If he shows up, he might be really mad that we're there. My friend Westy and I got in a car with Rob and his wife, and they drove us out to the house in La Push. So we're out there with no vehicle. We don't think anything of that. And it's several miles from town. It was already dark by the time that we had arrived. The house was in the middle of nowhere. The place was completely surrounded by forest and the forest was pitch black. I was relieved that we had a place to stay that night, but uh, being out in the middle of the woods in a cabin that somebody had died in just a few months before was a little weird. Things don't feel right. There's something wrong.
Rob's wife opened the porch door and we walked into the kitchen. There was a card table and there was some metal chairs. There was a refrigerator. There was an old phone on the counter. She showed us the fridge and told us that we could help ourselves. Oh. <coughs> uh, and then we went and explored the rest of the house. She took us into the bedroom. There was a nest made out of old women's clothing in the middle of the floor. And there's a man-sized hole in the nest. So she notices that we're looking at the nest of clothes and she explains, well, uh, my uncle hasn't really gotten over his mother's death. He had been sleeping in a pile of his dead mother's clothes which isn't normal. People don't normally do that. I look at the nest, and even though I feel sympathy for someone who's disturbed, he's really disturbed, it just f fills me with dread. And even though I joke with James about, you know, re re Norman Bates, you know, uh, it doesn't go away. It's, I, there's just this nagging dread in the back of my head. All right, well, good night. I didn't have anywhere to go. We were in the middle of the woods. It was the middle of the night, and it was below freezing outside. We didn't have any choice but to stay. When they left, we felt pretty nervous. We had just found out about her uncle. Uh, we didn't know that this was gonna be a problem when we went out to the cabin that night. I think her uncle's out of her mind and that we're in trouble if he shows up that night. We decide to keep all the lights in the house off, just in case the uncle were to show up. We don't want him to suspect that there's anybody in the house. Westy and I started talking about trying to find a place to, to sleep, but also some place to hide in case the uncle showed up and some place that we, we could defend if we had to. and that's when we found that there was a retractable stairway in the ceiling of the living room. I'll be right back. Wait, where? Rob's wife did say that he doesn't know we're out there and he would probably be upset if he came to the cabin and saw us there. She said that it was a hunting lodge, and so he thought her uncle might be armed with a gun. We decided that we needed to, to have a weapon to defend ourselves with, and I'd seen an ax when we walked in.
I grabbed the axe and uh, I brought it up the stairs. Now, when we got to the top of the stairs, we found an old dusty attic. The attic was an unfinished attic. Uh, there was exposed wood everywhere. You could see the rafters. and then we retracted the stairway so maybe the uncle wouldn't know that we were there. On one side of the attic, there were a couple of uh, dirty mattresses uh, lying on the floor uh, with some dusty quilts nearby. And there was a window right there facing out over the driveway. We can watch the driveway to see if her uncle's coming. We went and we sat on the mattresses and uh, opened up a bottle of booze that we had brought with us and started drinking and talking about old times. We're drinking and joking. He was at college, I was out of state. So we're catching up, joking at Rob's expense about just getting married. Even as we're talking to each other, uh, we, we never forgot uh, that the uncle might be showing up at any time. trying to focus on something other than we're stuck out in this cabin, there's a nest where a man has been sleeping in his mother's clothes. We had been talking to each other for quite some time and uh, all of a sudden we, we heard something. We heard the doorknob on the door being shaken violently like somebody was trying to get in. I just sit really still and I look at, J you know, James and I look at each other and we're, we're like, oh crap, somebody's here. We were terrified. tense up and it's like my my heart's in my stomach it sounded like whoever was trying to get in was upset they were angry and the door opens when I looked at Westy I saw that he was as scared as I was we were sitting there in the dark, staring right at each other, holding our breath. We thought it was the uncle uh, coming in, and so we were terrified. So we're sitting quietly for a few more minutes, and then we hear something else. We hear the sound of the card table and metal folding chairs downstairs being dragged across the floor. We were just full on freaked out. It was, it was just, just terrifying. I'm pretty scared. Uh, my, my heart is pounding. We just sit there quietly, um, listening and hoping that he doesn't find out that we're upstairs. We're hoping that they go, whatever it is down there goes away. Well, what now? I'm just trying to calm down. I'm making a decision as to whether I can really stay the night in that cabin or if I have any other options. We didn't have um, cell phone reception. We didn't have any choice but to stay. So uh, Westy and I hadn't heard anything downstairs for about a half an hour. And so we started talking to each other again, whispering. We heard the phone in the kitchen downstairs begin to ring.
And we waited for a while to see if anybody was going to answer it. It probably rang about 30 times before we decided that if the uncle was downstairs, he would have picked it up already. People don't let the phone ring that long unless it's really important. I decided to go downstairs and answer the phone. I picked up the ax and I climbed down the stairs. I can't see anything at the bottom of the stairs. I'm afraid that the uncle's still there and he's awake and then he might attack me. The living room is completely dark, but I can see inside the kitchen. I started feeling like there was somebody watching me from the dark and all of the hair on my body stood on end. The phone was sitting on the counter and ringing. <sighs> the phone is dead. There's nothing. There's no dial tone. There's nobody on the other line. There's no sound at all. I check the, the plug-in for the phone to the wall, and, and I see that the phone isn't plugged into the wall. It had been ringing by itself. Oh, instantly, this feeling of dread washed over me. And then the phone began to ring again. I had to get out of the kitchen as fast as I could. James, are you there? I climb back up into the attic. Uh, I feel like there's, there's something in the dark watching me the whole time. So he gets up and he just pulls the stairs up as fast as he can. He's, he's weirded out. And I'm like, well, who was it? And he goes, dude, there's... There was nobody on the line. There was no dial tone, nothing. I told Westy he could go down and look at it himself, but he decided he didn't want to go downstairs. I'm still freaked out. I'm not going to volunteer to go down there at all. I think he could see that I was really scared. Dude, there's no one there. I mean, well, at that point, things are lining up, and it's kind of like, okay, this place is freaking haunted. I didn't really feel like talking after that. And then the phone began to ring again. It just didn't stop. So I just started to count. One. Two, three, four.
97, 98, 99, 100. I count to well over a hundred rings before I decide it's there's no point in counting anymore. The last thing I remember before I fell asleep was was just thinking, what am I doing here? up I still had that same feeling of dread that I had when I was downstairs and answered the phone the type of person that I am uh, I wanted to find a rational explanation to help me deal with my fear and so I decided I wanted to go downstairs and investigate I had hoped to find evidence that the uncle had been there and that he had left uh, and that uh, it had all been a dream that the phone was plugged in, and, and I had imagined it all. So, Westy and I dropped the stairs, and we climbed down into the living room. We found it exactly the way that we had left it the night before. I let Westy examine the phone. I didn't want to go near it again. Uh, Westy went and picked up the phone. I go down and check on the phone, and I find out that it wasn't plugged in. Part of me felt vindicated that I hadn't made it up, that what I'd experienced is real. Uh, the other part of me uh, was was pretty creeped out. We looked all over for another phone. That was the only phone in the house. Come on, man, let's get out of here. Ah! Hey, what's going on? Did you try to call us? No, we didn't call. You guys didn't try to call. We chewed him out for leaving us there overnight <laughs> uh, and told him what had happened. I'm telling you, that house is haunted. Oh, come on. We asked them if they had tried to call us in the middle of the night, and Lacey said that they hadn't. I think the ghost probably wanted us out of there. I think that all the noises were angry, angry noises intended to scare us. I think it was grandma trying to get us out of her house. I don't think that she, she had lived there her whole life. She had died in that house and that she didn't want strangers staying there. Sitting there in the dark in that attic, listening to the phone ring, it was terror in the woods. My name is Eric Sterworth. In 2013, I was doing what was called the Hikers Challenge. I arrived at the trailhead the second week of August 2013, and uh, the weather was 
pleasant. It was probably in the 80s. Hardly a cloud in the sky. I like to walk alone because uh, it's kind of meditative to me. It's uh, great for thinking and uh, hashing things out in your mind. The section I'm hiking is on the border of Rock Castle and Laurel County in Kentucky. The day was only about 15 miles and I wanted to go a whole lot longer just so I didn't have to hike as much the next day. The trail was well maintained, but it was, uh, it was thick nonetheless. There were parts of it that weren't really blazed well, so you could easily get lost. It was exactly what I was looking for. It was dense, it was hilly, it was, it was a challenge. By the time I uh, got into the thick of the woods, um, it was probably about 10 or 11 in the morning. So I decided to sit down and take a quick snack and get a drink. That day I carried with me a, a small pocket knife that has like a corkscrew on it and a pair of scissors and that's it. I got up and I went right back to hiking. I was feeling really excited. You know, I was, I was roughly halfway finished with the trail. It started getting dark, so uh, I decided to stop there. It's pretty much a A-frame tent, so you can see out of it either end, but on the sides you can, uh, you're can you covered. Usually in the forest, you take your food and you put it in a dry sack and you throw it up over a tree to keep it away from bears. But uh, that night I decided to uh, just take my food and sleep with it because I was way too tired. I just took it in the tarp with me. I know a lot of people are screaming at me right now, saying uh, that's a bad thing to do, but I've spent months out in the woods by myself and never really had a problem. When I got into the sleeping bag, the sun was just setting over the horizon. It was a long day. It was a 26 mile day, so as soon as my head hit the pillow, I was out.
couple hours into sleep, I wake up to something crawling on me. Got up out of my tarp, started running around like a crazy man. I must have set my tent up over an anthill. The ants are crawling all over my body, all over my arms, all over my face. I swat them off me and that just angers them and they start biting me all over. I hear a sound down the ridge a little bit and it stops me in my tracks. Being out in the woods in the middle of the night, you know, you, you hear any kind of noise and you immediately think like, oh man, what, what's out there? It was moving around like it was startled. Hey, who's there? Who's there? I figured it was a big animal because nothing in the woods is that clumsy and makes that big of noise. I've seen bears before, so I just, you know, head back, pick up my tarp and move it away from the anthill. I crawl back in my sleeping bag and uh, don't even worry about the sound and fall right back asleep. I wake up again to something big on the side of my tent. This thing it definitely had mass to it. Uh, it wasn't just like a deer's hoofs walking. It, it, it was something with large feet. I've came across pretty much every single animal that is believed to be in the Eastern United States. And none of them really fit the description. It sounded like it was inches away from my head. The tarp itself was like swaying with, uh, with every step it took. Many other hikers I've backpacked with told me that when they've had encounters with bears, barking like a dog would scare them off. Woof! Woof! Started running away um, like I startled it. I hear the impact of the feet rustling the leaves along the way. The sound like seemed like super aggressive and it seemed like it was coming from a creature that was very, very big. It didn't sound like any animal that I've ever heard of. I know like deer make a wheezing noise, but this sounded much deeper, much more guttural. So it was either a mutant deer or 
it was something entirely different. I wanted to run, but I didn't know like where to run to. A lot of times with like large predators, if you run, they think that you are some sort of prey. It terrified me. I knew it was probably afraid of me. but I was just as equally afraid of it. When I didn't hear anything out there anymore, I packed up my tarp, packed up my sleeping bag and my sleeping pad, and I made a pretty large fire. Uh, then I took out my knife and I made sure I had it, you know, ready. And I sat there with my little pocket knife. I don't know what good it would have done. I knew whatever was out in the woods, it probably wouldn't have done any good fighting it with this knife. I was too worried that if I would leave in the middle of the night, I would either fall off a cliff or run into this creature. I was actually too scared to do anything, and I was kind of waiting for it to make the next move. So I sat next to the fire for the rest of the night, jumping at shadows. put out the fire, and I hightail it out of there. If a guy like me can have an experience like this, there's definitely a possibility that some large unknown creature exists that you know, we don't even know about. And uh, I thought about it all the way until I got to my truck. I think a lot of people like have these very like valid experiences and a lot of times people just discard them just because there's so much like stigma surrounding you know, the legend of Bigfoot. After the uh, experience, I'm definitely more tolerant of people's stories. I don't just like, you know, like, okay, well, yeah, whatever, buddy. You know, I, uh, I, I take time to listen to them. I never really even 
like considered I'd come across something of this nature. You know, it, it wasn't even in my mind. 